On the bird management side of things, well, there's lots of detail I'm gonna share with you today. The interesting thing about bird management, there's not a lot of change. There's some new technology, there's some new concepts, but overall, some of the sessions that I'm, and the photos that I'm sharing with you of some installations I've trained people on, you know, 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, but I've tried to make this as current as I possibly can. So um, what I'm going to do is share a screen with you and I'm just gonna disappear up to the top right-hand corner um, and we'll go from there. Looks a bit different to normal. Hang on, there we go. All right, so here we go. Hopefully you're seeing that presentation. Um, please tell me if you're not. <laughs> All right, I've got a few different screens here and it gets a little bit confusing. All right, now let's have a look at participants. All right, you're all still over there. And also when it comes to the chat function, I've moved it. Um, if you want to send me a message, please do. Um, there we go, chat function. It all just keeps moving. All right, so my presentation today. Well, first of all, I just want to actually focus on a bunch of different products that we use where we're going to use them, but we're also going to talk about some behavioural characteristics of birds themselves. So looking at our discussion today, uh, we are going to look at this um, group of products, but I want to start with a concept called bird pressure. This presentation is actually led on from another session I did last month called an introduction to bird management. We talked about a whole range of different concepts and behavioural characteristics of pest birds and the birds themselves. So now we're going to look at bird pressure and then assessing a site. And then we're going to look at a bunch of different products, but be it physical systems, deterrent systems. Uh, we'll look at uh, disinfecting your site briefly, uh, looking at sensor technology and then finishing off with training and, and, um, and tools. All right. So one of the things I'd like to sort of talk about today is bird pressure. Bird pressure is essentially a, a behavioral characteristics of birds or the flock. And then it essentially tells us how committed the birds are to the site that you're reviewing. So birds will be more committed because of the, uh, the layout of the facility or the stage of the life cycle that they're in, or they might be nesting and roosting because there's no human activity. So we'll look at the reason why birds are on that site and the impact it has. Now, the other thing that's really important is that we're going to use that characteristic or that behavioral process called bird pressure and how committed the birds are to determine what products or what strategy we're going to use on that site. And if you can link those two together, the issues associated with birds and how committed they are to the site, link that with the product or the strategy, then you're going to have a better chance of success. The one thing in, in whether we're talking about termites or any form of pest management and specifically in bird control, products generally don't fail. It's normally the user that's used the wrong product in the wrong location that ends up with birds overwhelming that system. I often say to people, you know, they say, oh, birds are nesting on the spikes. Well, the birds were nesting in that area before you put the spikes down. The spikes were just doing what spikes do. It's just edge protection. So a really important concept to get across. All right. So um, then we look at heavy bird pressure. So birds themselves, want to basically be nesting and roosting at least once a year, but some birds, as we found when we talked last month, will have anywhere up to four broods a year. So when we're finding birds that are nesting, they're very committed to the site. They were probably born on that site. They've had offspring on that site. They've created a family grouping and they're not going anywhere without your intervention. So then we look at a site, do we see birds nesting and birds present? obviously with their nests and their roosting overnight, we know that that is the most difficult area to get birds out of. So also we might look at that site and realize that like in, um, well, I'm not in a studio here, I'm in our warehouse. So I've got like a, an eight meter high ceiling here. So I know that the birds, if they were in this building, they'd be way out of what you'd call human intervention. And so ceiling heights or just depth of a facility or the lack of people, leads us to see birds you know succeeding now the building structure also lends itself to 
um, birds in a heavy pressure situation. So we've got beams and purlins above my head, but it might be a loading dock out the front or areas where birds can be warm. They're gaining radiant heat from, you know, the, the winter in my warehouse right now, it's seven degrees. <laughs> so it's cold, but up towards the roof, the birds are getting some radiant heat from the day. And then the other thing is, the birds might have a very long history of population growth on that site. So all of those things lead to what I would consider a heavy pressure situation. And then I would determine what product to use based on that. All right, then we look at a medium pressure situation. So we're grading bird pressure. Birds are fairly committed to the site. There's no unprotected area where the birds are spending the night. It just could be an open um, sports stadium, or it could be in this case, a, uh, a school grounds or a correctional facility where there's occasional food. So we know that the birds are attracted to this for site, but they're not spending the night and because there's no true coverage. And so I class this open area as a medium pressure situation. There's some food, there's enough activity to attract the birds, but they're not spending the night. And then we look at a light pressure situation. That's when we're looking at a true like Aussie full sun area. There's a lot of heat, a lot of exposure, direct wind and direct rain. So we know that on the flat area of a particular roof, except maybe the gutters, but the flat area of the roof, the birds are too exposed. They're probably not spending the day, sorry, the night in that area. Um, they're just spending time during the day um, to either communicate or to digest food, uh, maybe as a stopover between an area where food is present and then there's a, 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 um, a roost. So the birds will often congregate and, and communicate. And so they're definitely not spending the night on this particular parapet. So I would call this parapet a light pressure situation. The guttering or underneath the air conditioning systems or the air conditioning bay might be a different story, but right along that parapet, I'm calling it a light pressure situation and I will determine my product strategy based on that. All right, now our presentation last month talked, sorry, it talked about a lot of these things, but I wanna just go through them because looking at the bird pressure, then I'll assess the site before I even think about what product I'm going to use. So first of all, I need to establish the bird species. What am I dealing with there? You know, is it pigeons and larger birds or is it smaller birds like sparrows, Indian miners and so on? How aggressive are they? Uh, how are they impacting the building and so on? Then I would determine the bird pressure, nesting, roosting, feeding, loafing, whatever it might be. Then I'd also look at the, the stage of the bird behavior. What are they actually doing there? Is it peak season for that bird? Are they nesting and roosting or is it different things happening throughout the year? Then the one thing that I'm gonna do is actually talk to my client or you're gonna to talk to your client. We need to access the history of the birds on that site. Are they seeing birds there when you're not, when you're there for your inspection? Are you actually seeing the right bird species? Um, has it just been cleaned the day before you got there so you're not seeing the extent of the droppings and the impact? How long have those birds been there for? And all that information, there's no greater wealth of information than your, than your client. Regardless of whether they're an expert, it's not important. So then also we might talk to, or you might talk to your suppliers or colleagues. And suppliers obviously will have the information that you need to maybe support you with training. If you haven't done this style of bird management before, you need to know product codes or pricing, or hopefully they can assist um, as my business would with um, uh, quoting support, um, proposal templates, and all the information you need to even give presentations or site visits. And then you talk to your colleagues. A lot of your peers in this marketplace of bird management are obviously people that can assist you in, in getting you know, what you need in terms of um, yeah, the advice or the assistance or the right supplier to use. Uh, there are Facebook forums around each state. And then there's the, the largest one, which is Australian Pest Managers Network, which um, uh, um, many of you um, get my webinar information from or our pest IT socials, but they're great ways to actually throw up ideas, ask questions, um, and hopefully positively get the right in an answers to, to what you're looking for, what products, what to use where, and so on. Then I'd actually determine what are the impacts that the birds are having on that facility. Uh, the, is the droppings impacting food safety? Is it uh, damage to packaging or inventory? Or is it the front facade of the building? 
determine what the birds are doing. And then I'd look at establishing what I call a financial burden. What's the impact financially on that building or on that client? And then I'd establish a product proposal and a, and like a, a value of a, the proposition um, of, your, you know, of your strategy to match the financial burden. So there's no point in doing a $100,000 project or at least proposing something if it's just got bird droppings on the front of the, the building that can be just cleaned up weekly. What we need to do is match a simple solution to suit that financial burden. Then we'll look at uh, creating the product and installation strategy, a proposal and installation plan. And then a lot of bird management processes are just once off projects. What I'd like you to consider is how can I then extend that relationship with that client? How can I assist them in the future? Is there monitoring, be it going to visit and doing an inspection annually, reviewing your installation, reviewing other areas, understanding what the bird behavior is and offering a report. It could be a simple template. Um, happy to help you with that. But I just think that sometimes the once off project in bird management, we underestimate the value of creating ongoing relationships. Okay, now I'll send this to you in form of notes and so on, um, because sometimes some of these discussions are a bit long winded. Same with this session uh, part here. Here are the products that we all know as typical products that encompass bird management. You've got your exclusion systems, so netting and mesh and so on, uh, ledge deterrent systems, uh, the typical either uh, electrified or just physical devices that we'll put on ledges and parapets, and we'll look at that in a sec, and population control. And um, I'll only touch on small element of population control, open space or open area, deterrent systems, so sound and visual, and then uh, in some cases, uh, human harassment, dogs or drones or whip crapping, cracking can be used in places like open tip yards. I won't touch on that too much, but there are a bit of a, a snapshot. And of course, finishing with monitoring of uh, monitoring sensors, sorry, sensors to use either before or after a, a project's done. And I'll touch on that briefly. All right. So the first and the most basic element of bird management is your ledge deterrent systems. Essentially, you've just got a long architectural feature where you've got birds uh, on our screen just landing on it. And it uh, could be also known as a stringer or a parapet or other areas like column capitals and so on. I'll touch on those in a second. But basically what we've got to do is, are we going to try and keep the birds off that entire ledge or are we only just going to offer edge protection to stop the birds from pooping over the edge? So the idea is that we want to stop the birds from landing or do we want to remove them and then cover the entire ledge? So it's really important with bird spikes or bird wire to make sure that we cover that entire ledge because the birds will just land over the other side. Um, physical systems only move the birds from left to right. And so if we don't cover the entire area, then we're going to run into trouble. So just really quickly, I'll just touch on a couple of the obvious ones. There's a ledge here on our screen, a, a window ledge, uh, from a building ledge, a column capital, parapets, but we've also got stringers and other architectural features there that will basically be a haven for the birds to, you know, nest and roost on if it's, if it's a wide enough ledge and got some protection. But on a north face in the middle of summer, all we're going to do is have birds there for a short period of time. And as we can see here on that parapet, we've got um, seagulls just sitting on an open deterrent, uh, open parapet, just keeping an eye on things. Um, seagulls do buck the trend a little bit because they can actually nest in open roofs here in Melbourne, particularly, and they can be out in full sun and they'll be quite happy to do that. So let's look at some of the products that we might incorporate into a, a ledge or parapet uh, arrangement. So we've got products like Bird Shock, um, Shock Track, there's lots of different brands out there. Bird Shock Flex Track, I'll just show you on the screen here, was the original. Uh, electrified shock system that we introduced into Australia in 2004. So that product still excites us, available in lots of different colors. Now we look at the pressure rating that we give that product. If birds are nesting on there, I still think that we have to look at a physical deterrent to keep birds off because they'll continue to bring their nesting material and that will wreak havoc with the use of an electrified system. So I give that a rating of uh, a pressure rating of medium, but it will keep all birds off and if we can use enough of it on a building, you will deter them off in, you know, indefinitely with some good um, management and good maintenance and so on. So on the right hand side of our shot here, we've got just a typical parapet 
open area, you've got birds coming in and picking up the pebbles and dropping them over the edge. And that's one way of actually stopping birds from accessing those parapets. Um, just two leading unit, uh, two leading um, uh, rows of the product would be sufficient and you could even have an extra one if the pressure was considered greater. All right, and typically the, the nice thing about your different shock track systems that are available in the marketplace are available in colors. You can match it to the building when, you're, when you've got the uh, ledge above your eye line or it's certainly out of reach, it's virtually going to be an invisible uh, product from the street or ground level. And so here it's actually matched beautifully with the, the, uh, the masonry, uh, but generally it's going to be not visible at all. And that's one of the beauties of that particular product. The nice thing is that all of us have been tuned in the last 30 years to using bird spikes. And so bird shock gave us all an alternative, one for low visibility, but also to take the deterrent factor up several levels. When a bird gets shocked, they really want to stay off that particular building. So on the left-hand side, we've got a sign with um, bird spikes that's quite visible. On the right-hand side, the shock track or bird shock uh, is a useful but also low visibility option to keep birds off signs. Then we look at examples of buildings on our left hand side we've got bird damage, bird droppings on a parapet and so unlike bird spikes that might require four rows of um, bird spikes or three rows on when you've got 400 millimeters um, this particularly wide parapet on the front and rear edge is generally enough to cover that area. So just looking at this particular job, it had bird droppings on the front, but more so on the front facade, uh, causing some damage to that particular building. So that's the after shot. And so not only did birds stay off that leading edge of the parapet, but it also kept birds off the greater part of the roof. So using electrified systems can be quite useful in a wider level of deterrence just purely because the birds have a memory of being shocked on that building. So really useful in how that's being used. Another example of an installation I remember doing with a, a colleague of many, many years of mine. Uh, this is a rail station here in uh, here. I'm, I'm not from Sydney anymore. Sorry, I'm in Melbourne. This is a rail station in Sydney. In fact, this was Hurstville station. And so this, you just have to see that because of the local community were feeding the birds, we've got literally hundreds of pigeons just in a small area, just sitting on the leading edge and the, the beams of this particular awning. And so during this installation, so we've got two rows of bird shock in an L shape, and then we've got a row of bird spikes just down on the lowest part of this particular I beam. So then, um, sorry, just letting some more people in. Um, we actually did this installation from ladders and I don't like working on ladders, but I was there with my mate, Ken. And so the interesting thing is we were able to get this installation done in literally a matter of a few hours. So that after seeing that before shot of a couple of hundred birds, we literally turned the unit on. And what's nice is a couple of years later, Ken rang and said, oh, look, we need to go and have a look at that site. Uh, we need just to upgrade the, um, the solar panel. We did that and cleaned it off and that was done six or seven, no, no, maybe seven or eight years ago. Okay. And so then of course, after the installation, the birds were removed from that canopy. But of course, here's an example, where do they go? This is across the road. I took a photo and saw all a couple of hundred birds just head off and off they went to the, uh, the neighboring <laughs> buildings. That was obviously cause for potential work. Um, Ken didn't mind, he was just happy just to do that client. Whereas other clients that would be quite gung-ho, just go and put the business cards in to maybe look at how they can actually solve some problems. And of course he would have looked at the way he'd make some money. Another example of bird shock used in, con in, in conjunction with uh, netting. So this is a, a light well here in, um, oh, sorry, here in Sydney. So I'm not in Sydney, sorry, in Sydney. And so the bird shock is used on the parapet around the edge to actually stop the birds from sitting on that edge and then defecating down, you know, seven or eight levels. And so this was full of pigeons and the exclusion and the electrified system worked beautifully to keep the birds not only out of the light well on seven or eight levels below, but also to stop them from sitting on and around the bird netting. And it worked in incredibly well. Another example, actually there's some pulling out some old photos here from my hometown of Karingbar, but this was a site that needed, um, bird 
shock on multiple levels, both the parapet and in amongst and behind the, the louvers. So this was a new building, pigeons moved in immediately. And so that the bird shock was put in. And so this is an example of just hundreds of installations that have been done, done over, over the years. But that was just a classic neat example where you can discreetly um, deter birds from either the parapet or the um, deep, deep ledges to stop birds from congregating. But again, classic example, brand new building, and then doesn't take long for pigeons to um, become a problem. Now on the type of bird shock, so we, there are a multitude of different brands, but another one that we developed, when you've got like small roof areas and you've got large numbers of birds, we came up with a product um, and we called it Electro Bird. And the idea is that we're just using a variety of different, uh, unfortunately you can't see me point to this, but there's wires here in a grid system. And so we have a, a, an energizer just like we would with a bird shock system. And then we have these insulated plastic bases. And then we just have them at regular intervals every 10 meters or whatever it might be and spring tension wires. And those wires are electrified. So we called that electro bird. And that was a great way to keep birds off really intense situations. It's not only just uh, guarding that leading edge, but it's actually going right across a roof. And we've used that in quite a few instances. And, and we've got you know, a few clients that enjoy that particular product, it's quite useful. So now moving away from the electrified system, which would have probably the, your highest level of deterrence when it comes to um, uh, the shocking of the birds themselves, um, harmlessly shocked, of course, nobody's, um, hurt in any way but the birds it's memorable for the birds then we go to physical systems like bird spikes and of course we've all used bird spikes over the years but the important thing is to link that with bird pressure do not use bird spikes where the birds are nesting i wouldn't use bird spikes in high pressure situ situations the birds will continue to bring their nesting material landing on the spikes platform is created and then birds continue to roost directly on your spikes so i say bird spikes never fail it's just the installer underestimates the situation. So bird pressure, medium. Target species, large birds only, pigeons, ravens, ibis, and so on. Not suitable for sparrows, miners, and starlings. And people say that they have uh, bird spikes for, you know, um, swallows and starlings and miners. I don't think so, it doesn't, doesn't exist. But certainly the installation of the product is really easy. Use the right glue. Glue is so important when it comes to Correct, the correct bond, um, you know, has to be UV stable, dry flexible, and ask your supplier, really critical that you use the right type of bird spike, uh, bird spike glue or bond. Um, not suitable for nesting areas, and then you've got options these days. You know, when I first went to the States, um, representing the company I worked for back in 1994, you know, we had one bird spike. And now, of course, we've all got access to uh, fully stainless steel bird spikes, polycarbonate based bird spikes, and a variety of different um, spikes for different purposes, for beams, for gutters, and, and so on. So just looking at what we're going to be trying to achieve is that on a, on a parapet where we've just literally got like a, a ledge with no back, that's the surrounding of a, a, of a roof, we want to cover that ledge or the parapet from front to back. So I have to have overhang to the front and overhang to the back, that might take uh, a series of rows. Then if I look at eye beams, I can use narrow spikes. So we have spikes that start from about 65 millimeters wide, and that will just go directly on the base of an eye beam. And then of course, there's no matter to where you can put bird spikes, as long as you have covered the fact that the birds aren't nesting there and it won't end up with either nesting material or with deciduous trees, just getting full of material that's going to cause problems and allow the birds to come back. So just on a leading edge, like a parapet, you're just going to have a nice, simple installation to give you, you know, front to back edge protection. And so now, of course, we've got a variety of different you know, brands of, of extra wide spikes that'll have a, a 200 millimeter wide uh, width, which allows you to minimize the number of rows that you're using, or hopefully have that one width covering the entire ledge that you're working on. All right, another option that I would consider, and again, multiple brands available, bird slide, bird slope, bird slip. There's all sorts of different processes. Um, we have a, 
option here with obviously bird slide this is a plastic this is the original you know bird slide product um, introduced by bird barrier many years ago we now make uh, a derivative of that here in australia we actually make that out of color bond and we design it and um oh damien you're saying that you can't hear me is that you or is it can everyone not hear me testing one two three we're halfway we're, that's a worry um if anyone can actually give me a thumbs up or just tell me that uh hang on can everyone hear me <laughs> might just be you damien i can hear you good chris okay thumbs up so um damien so you're muted but you might have to just check your um yeah your speakers because i'm afraid it looks like it could be just you excellent can i hear your thoughts on nova control over control yep get that later got it ah damien you've got it sweet all right so uh bird slide the idea of bird slide literally is the birds would literally go to the the ledge and they would slide off because when we've got a variety of different bird species you've got swallows and smaller birds they're going to get in amongst your bird spikes and so bird slide was uh, the next level on from that so suitable for ledges that have a solid backing i mean we have used it going onto the back of glass but normally you just want a solid ledge with a solid wall behind and um, somebody recently put on specifications can use bird slide on struts or parapets but the idea is the bird still lands on the the, the leading edge so what's really important is that you use the right product for the right location one thing i like about bird slide is that you can use it in nesting situations because there's no way for the birds to be able to um, access that territory that they once nested on the other element to it is because we make it now locally you can get it made in any color you can at any width and then we just ship that australia wide so bird slide or bird slope bird uh, slip they're all pretty much of similar nature but we do find that, that making it to order is a much easier process all right bird wire so going back to the original rent-a-kill avi strand back 30 years ago well bird wire is just now readily available and used um, what's really important is your pressure rating that you that we i and many have given to bird wire light pressure only so when i see our photo on our right here i look at that and go that's the ideal spot to put bird wire nice and open in the direct sunlight um, the birds aren't going to be nesting on that particular area all we're doing is creating an unstable ledge for pigeons or larger birds not to be used for smaller birds installation is really detailed it's quite labor intensive so you need to factoring that into your pricing suitable for exposed areas and also requires maintenance so some of your larger birds will land on it and stretch or damage your uh, springs or even the wires themselves obviously maintenance contractors will just destroy this particular product so an annual maintenance is really important but i would definitely not use this product for a nesting situation so bird wire the nice thing is it's really developed over the years so that's on the right hand side see our simple concept we've got a rigid post a uh, spring under tension and then nylon coated stainless steel wire with a ferrule that literally is the product but of course then we can actually have additional attachments for a whole lot of different areas metal masonry brickwork beams gutters and so on so bird wire again on the right hand side is our classic installation there the use of two different heights of pole post is really important because the birds will try to land and put their feet on either side and so the idea of the different uh, heights is just to just make it difficult for the birds to not put their weight over across or put their legs on or nesting material on so the other element to this photo here on the right is uh that the oh, more people coming in um is that that is inserted into the brickwork great way to damage a building of course but more importantly it's the strongest way to have bird wire because of course if you've got a nice strong post you can get great attention and it'll last longer so again another example of the product used in the right location out in exposed areas glue on bases or in this case they're 
inserted in or the, the base has actually been uh, drilled in. When I'm using glue on base, it's really important to, to ensure that you have decided that the gluing has enough time to cure over 24 hours for you to come back the next day to do your tensioning. Often to try and to do both on the same day is going to end in failure. So the screws can be used as additional strength or if you don't have the time in order to uh, wait for the glue to cure if you've just got a once off visit to the site. Um, the one thing apart from using screws, uh, glue on bases can be used on uh, most heritage buildings and obviously you need to check with the building owner. Now platform protection. Uh, moving away from ledges for a minute, I'm going to start going through as many uh, mm -hmm. options as I can. Looking at platform protection. So that could be uh, a light as we see in our photo here or air conditioning systems or roof peaks and so on or even small roof areas. I can use products like um, A Pro Huntsman or Daddy Long Legs. There's other brands called Spider and so on. This is an example of just putting something to try and create some instability. Now, the ones that are the, probably the better option, like Daddy Long Legs or Huntsman, they actually rock, revolve around in the, the wind, but also as the birds go to land, the wind created by their wings also helps to spin and bring it to life. So there's, you know, a reasonable number of areas that you can use this product in, uh, but most importantly, only suitable for light pressure situations. Again, linking behavior with the product, it's not suitable for nesting situations. So here's an example of the classic installation for a daddy long legs on top of a, an air conditioning condenser. And so that is where I would use it at the most. On the right hand side, just on a roof peak because I might have birds just using a loafing point or a food digesting point. That's their favorite spot. So daddy long legs or huntsman or spider can be used in that sort of situation. All right, so platform protection onto visual deterrence. So a product that uh, Pest IT introduced to Australia back in 2006, 2008. Um, Eagle Eye is a really interesting product. And you, an example where you might have wins and, wins and losses with a product just purely because of a, a lack of recognition for what the purpose of the product is. So this visual deterrent works in open spaces, but only deters birds in flight. So if we're creating a zone around a building, we actually have to treat the whole building because birds will continue to land on the roof, walk around the roof, and it's um, lost the opportunity to create the, the deterrence that it's designed to do. So we look at this thing that only deters birds in flight. So therefore we have to look at the entire building and therefore one building, or sorry, one product has a blind spot. And so the idea of two or more systems will be needed. And in fact, if you look at a building, naturally it might have four corners or it might be indented at many corners, might have high points. And so it's really important with that particular product that we sit down and design it as a system. So here's an example, and I'll just run through some photographs. Here's a, uh, oops, okay. Uh, that particular one on the, the eagle eye is just down on the bottom left. And you can see that it's actually deterring birds off this boat, it's moored but it's actually only just moving birds away from the, uh, an area. It's only doing um, enough to work in the, the immediate area. If it was a systematic approach, you could remove birds from that entire uh, number of births. Uh, powering Eagle Eye can be really simple, uh, wind-driven, solar, 12 volt, because they're a 12 volt system, a battery operated or 240 volt. So that you've got a variety of different options. I've used Eagle Eye on the left here in strawberry fields, um, assisted people installing the product on uh, universities and resorts. So it's had a great level of value when it's been installed correctly. Uh, but there has been plenty of situations where perhaps the, the uh, bird pressure has been underestimated or the whole building hasn't been uh, done or we've left out the high points of a building like the one on the top right hand corner because we couldn't get to the high points. So there's an example where we have some, um, some, success, some success and it's a, been a really useful product. Another example of where we use it quite regularly is with cockatoos. In fact, for some reason, eagle eye or even visual deterrence, regardless of the brand, is really useful against cockatoos. Cockatoos are probably the most 
sophisticated and smartest birds that we're trying to work with, obviously a protected species. So we need to look at ways to deter them in a non-lethal way. So here's an example where corellas were coming down and causing problems on a golf course, but we've used it on a variety of different ovals, sporting facilities, tennis clubs, a whole variety of different ways to keep birds um, like damaging birds like cockatoos off sporting facilities. But same with off, um, off buildings, cockatoos will come in and spend a lot of time damaging uh, buildings just by exercising their beaks and sharpening their beaks and obviously creating a nuisance for the building owner well eagle eye has been really useful for that another example on the right here is at a human waste uh, treatment plant so again eagle, eagle eye has been quite useful as a deterrent in that regards uh, when um, this is actually up in um, in brisbane uh, clients use this in a grain facility and so that's been hardwired in. So a simple way to actually uh, create a, a water resistant, but 240 volt operation that will just be working 24 seven. Other options in your eagle eye range would be wind driven units, uh, little bird breezes. So these will give you a deterrence of only a few meters, but great to be used around solar panels. I'm gonna talk about solar exclusion shortly and things like bird breezes and pro propellers can be really useful. Uh, because just by deterring birds, we often can't just assume that they're going to move off a building. And so additional deterrents are often used. Okay, population management. Most of you have obviously got some plan when it comes to population management. Obviously, uh, three areas of population management is shooting, trapping and poisoning. I'm just going to talk about trapping really quickly because when it comes to trapping pigeons, obviously there's limited issues, limited um, problems with uh, legislation and, and animal welfare, but they're the elements that you're going to look at. So the other thing that is going to present itself to you is the daily monitoring of your traps. And so I've just put here a, a little bottom right hand side, an example of a sensor that you can put on a trap to alert you when you've got your first number, first bird going into the trap. So population management or particularly trapping is really just used to maybe reduce the bird pressure on your system that you've you've installed or that you're proposing. And then when we look at some of the difficult birds to control, well, Indian miners, Indian miners, uh, the trap that we uh, got involved in a decade or so ago, back in the late eighties, sorry, yeah, late eighties and early nineties, Australian National University created a two chamber trap for the use of uh, trapping Indian miners and starlings. So that was later developed into what is our trap, the, the mini miner magnet. And so that's been useful all over the world for trapping the common miner or the Indian miner. And I guess that's incorporating trap design and the attraction of food and then some simple trapping techniques that can be really useful. Um, homeowners and, and building, building managers can um, utilize this. Um, the hard part about this particular product is you really don't want Indian miners to see you actually messing with their food source or uh, interacting with the trap. So, um, from a professional perspective, it's really difficult to try and negotiate timing around being able to uh, do a professional trapping program for miners. Difficult bird to manage. Uh, but here's some trapping that I've done, um, training a group over in the uh, South Pacific. And so when you can set your traps and do, do, so, do so outside of daylight hours, the, the product itself can be really not only unique, but, but successful. All right, solar exclusion. I guess this is a new marketplace that really emerged in the last 10 years. As the Australian marketplace has grown in terms of buildings with more domestic and commercial solar arrays, we've now seen pigeons move from you know, the, the townships out to suburbia. And so on the right-hand side here, we've got a tiled roof uh, with a, a decent um, uh, solar array, I think nine kilowatts. And so the idea is that pigeons will get underneath there getting radiant warmth off the, off the building, um, no, no human interaction, particularly on a two-story building, but getting away and just being able to nest and, and uh, create family groupings just on a domestic building. So when it comes to solar exclusion, um, we can safely say that we can exclude birds from underneath that. It's a heavy pressure situation. And by using a physical barrier, we're deterring the birds out from underneath the solar panels. But 
will the birds immediately go? The answer is probably not. In fact, I reckon many of us that are in our group here today have probably experienced doing something like this, but finding the birds will continue to nest and roost. And that's where additional either trapping or uh, deterrent systems are needed to be incorporated with the use of, of um, solar exclusion. So looking at the installation, it's very easy, great for domestic and commercial solar arrays. Some systems uh, that are obviously on a 45 degree angle, we need to look at different widths of mesh, but we can um, assist you in that. But it is going to keep the birds from nesting underneath that and causing damage to the roof and the scratching on the roof, which is causing problems in domestic situations. And so it's going to do all of that. But it's important that um, there may be more needed. And then you can combine that with uh, cleaning, um, visual spelt wrong, but uh, a visual deterrent system like Bird Breezer on either end of this uh, would be a way to actually keep the birds off this particular rooftop. So solar exclusion mesh, variety of different brands out there. Um, I'm showing you the Ave Pro version here on the screen. So really simple to do your corners. I'd normally be using a laser pointer to show you there, but you can see the corner and that's just bent around and then cut and then you can use cable ties or whatever it might be. But the idea is the clips will hold that and lock it in quite nicely. The beauty of this particular clip on our right hand side here is that it's not only got the circlip, it's also got a locking nut and that seems to be missing on a lot of the systems that are out there. And obviously it's important that if you do an installation, you'd like to see it locked into place, um, not just forever, but at least for 10 years to give your client value for money. All right, netting. This is my favorite area. I was really lucky back in the early 90s to go over to America and get trained and see how broad the, rain, the, the range of different netting systems were, but also to see what international pest management firms were doing back in the, uh, both in Europe and America in that early 90s. Now, when we link bird netting to bird pressure, we can use bird netting in all pressure situations and with all bird species because we're putting a physical barrier between the outside of a building or the inside of a building to where the birds want to be. Obviously we can't net everything, but in a lot of cases we can be creative and look at total exclusion. It's really quite the, the, the top shelf of, of what we're trying to achieve in bird netting uh, or in bird deterring. We have different net sizes, different mesh sizes, different mesh colors and Typically a 19 mil or a 50 mil black netting is our most commonly used uh, system. Oh, so I'm just gonna show you a bunch of photos. This to me is the classic netting installation and we're training a, a company on site on this particular day. So we're bird netting an awning and a loading dock and you're doing uh, cabling around the perimeter, maybe cabling on along your beams or just to basically link in your from net to your neck, next net. Everything's done under tension and that's the completed job we're looking at and it's virtually invisible and that's the beauty of bird netting. And so here's another example, a large project here in Melbourne. And that's, you can just see the reason why we use bird netting is because if you looked at all the beams, the struts, the pipes, the lights, it's just not possible to do all of the, uh, say bird spiking to all that arrangement and the birds would get in amongst it anyway. Bird netting just creates a false ceiling that's workable in most cases uh, with the facility. And so here's another example of a, a huge installation uh, done here in Melbourne, you know, in the last decade. And so netting to the, uh, to the uh, flower markets and the um, Melbourne uh, fruit and vegetable markets. So a, a project that was just done over a series of months and uh, it's just an ongoing process with uh, installations and an ongoing maintenance and zipper upgrading and so on. So these are things that just are a great example of what can be achieved by professional pest management companies. Here's another example, um, myself training uh, Paul here and just showing him how we're going to do uh, and do a layout. And so at this case, I'll have shown him how to do all the uh, cabling under tension and we can look at that in another webinar, how we go about each individual job. But here's an example of just incorporating site safety, training on access equipment and being there to oversee a, pro a project. It's kind of like the favorite thing that we do here at Pest IT. Another example here in Melbourne is courtyard 
netting. So when you look at a job and you see all the pipes or the balustrades, the, the window ledges, often we think, can we enclose that area? And here's a, a 30 meter by 30 meter um, uh, open uh, courtyard in a, in a in a hospital. And so the interesting thing is you can see a series of cables going across and even there's a net join. So we actually had to join the nets. In fact, we've got net joins in two locations and then just pull the whole thing over. And we had to do that a couple of different times to get that right. But that ended up being a two or three day project, two day project and completed beautifully. And literally it's very difficult to see. Another example of a one day project, I'm taking a photograph here in the process of it just being completed. But again, with um, roof access points, just walking around the roof, this is actually reasonably high off the ground and several levels below, but just netting straight across, stop the birds from going in, down several levels into an underground car park, nesting and roosting and creating a lot of mess and noise and smell. And so courtyard netting can be just really useful, simple and discreet. Then of course you've got your elevator netting. Now this is a real feature here in Melbourne. In fact, I was really hardly aware of it, you know, five or 10 years ago until I moved down to Melbourne. Uh, but that's where we use uh, a series of poles and cables and 50 or 19 mil net. And the idea is particularly with seagulls that are nesting on roofs in open places. So seagulls would normally nest on in the grasslands of Victoria, but with foxes and human interaction, they're now nesting on roofs. So they're actually in the open, and so the elevator netting just removes the bird's access to the, the air conditioning systems and all the areas uh, like gutters and, and areas where the birds would actually be nesting. And then it also creates about a two to 2.2 meter distance between the birds and the radiant heat that they're going to get off that roof. It gets bloody cold here in Melbourne. All right, here's an example of in a um, netted area. So you can see the tall, uh, poles done at 10 by 10 meter grids and then just creating a false ceiling of netting over that particular roof. And in other ways of using bird netting, what's on the left hand side here is column capitals here in Melbourne. On the right hand side, actually it's Fitzroy, you can see where somebody's tried to use bird spikes and the birds over time have just knocked the birds spikes off where they were and then they've continued to nest and roost. So column capitals, while I've got a close up photo here on the left, and it looks very obvious, but when the photo is sort of looked back from ground level, it's barely noticeable. And they can be really useful in conjunction. In fact, above the bird netting there, you can see a post and wire system is also in, in place on this heritage listed building. And of course you can do netting in all sorts of interesting areas. So that's myself training someone uh, on a 65 foot or 80 foot knuckle boom that's actually on a barge uh, in the Adelaide River. And so netting, in the surrounds and openings of a, of a bridge, the twin bridges there. Typically though, you'll see um, birds impacting uh, loading docks. So this is the loading dock of a, a hospital. And so rather than netting the entire uh, loading dock, all we've done here is just put uh, two or three runs of bird netting to encase uh, the ducting here. And that can just be a simple way and discreet way of neatly and tidily removing birds from the access of their roost. And of course your classic example is generally your, your loading docks. This is in Tamworth. I remember training a team back, um, back in the day. And so example where we're just cabling and netting and you know, using a string line to make sure we get nice straight cable lines and then cabling along the front of the parapet. This is an area where we also have uh, starlings particularly impacting the inside of this, this um, mail depot. So the inside was netted, the outside was netted. If you can just actually see on the right hand side, you can see that there's a fitting on the cable in between the profile of the trim deck. And that's really important to make sure that your cabling is just done in such a way that we're deterring and leaving no areas for access to the particular bird species you're working with. And then your classic example too is also large open uh, loading docks. So again, when you've got birds coming into a, a food production facility, even with high speed doors, the netting is really important to stop the birds from having a, a resting point before uh, racing inside. And so that was an example in a Melbourne warehouse where that was achieved, stopping the birds 
from actually nesting and roosting in the canopy, but also reducing the impact of birds coming into the facility. So that, that's the netting side of things and I'll just move on. But the nice thing about netting um, from when I first got involved in bird netting back in the early 90s, there's a whole variety of different fittings and fixtures to help you bird netting in just about every construction type of that, you know, every construction's type and of material. Um, but also, I guess the nice thing is we've got a, a large number of the pest control community using that technique these days and doing their own bird netting, which is fabulous. And I guess you know, the larger and the more adventurous installations also led to some really exciting forms of bird management. So I really love seeing what you all are doing out there, which is cool. Another new technology that I've been working on um, with the RatSense group is also uh, a product called AveSense. And essentially that's an avian or bird sensor. And so this way we can track, we can detect, we can get an idea of population density, and offer your client, you know, real-time reporting, but also automated reporting. And so when a client is given heat mapping to, to, to tell them, you know, the impact of birds, it's one thing, but actually tell them how many birds, where they're impacting and what impact you could then have on those birds. So when you look at uh, a trend analysis, um, there's a, a way that you can actually say, well, this is uh, what the birds are doing and it would probably warrant actually doing some form of bird deterrent system and then the sensors could be then moved. So to give you an idea, here's a, uh, an image of a building that's segmented in four areas and I've got 20 sensors around the roof of this particular building. And you can see some purple dots, which tells me I've got bird activity. And then the red dots actually tells me I've got high levels of activity, which indicates bird nesting. And so uh, another example on the top right hand of our screen here, we can see a graph and the graph has uh, 440 activations in one particular day. So in this particular building, I had 400 activations of birds um, going past the sensors. And then I then put in a bird deterrent system. And then I can see that over the next month, I had a significant drop in the activity of the birds. So birds can also, uh, bird sensors can also be effectively uh, useful in, you know, sharing information with your client. So bird site disinfectants, well, I think that's a really critical part of what you do with your bird management clients. You know, I think that bird management systems is important, creating the right solution for your client, but actually cleaning the site, but also making the facility safe, safe for your clients' employees, but also safe for your own employees is really important. Regardless of the product that you use, cleaning is obviously a, uh, a a value proposition and a cost component of the process uh, might also help make the process more profitable. But more importantly, when you're bird netting over an area that's got bird dropping stains on there, those stains will stay there. They'll continue to react with the paintwork or the impact that, you know, uh, damage that's caused on the surface, but also it's going to look unsightly. And so cleaning that facility is not only making it safe, it's also giving the, the client a nice uh, clean finish. But avian pathogens are a very, very significant and important thing for you to be aware of. I did a, a little bit of an article that's on our website that if you, I didn't have enough time to go through today, but if you, I'll share the link with you when I send out the, um, the notes from today's presentation. And really important to be aware of, you know, how dangerous it is to work in some of these environments. So it's important not only to have a clean site for your client, but a clean site for your team members. All right, bird management tools. Well, we've kind of been blessed with the different companies we worked with and we've learned so much over a 20 to 30 year period. So the idea of various tools will help make your job more efficient, faster, hopefully cheaper, uh, reduce labor and fatigue and save you money. And so the, um, the pneumatic net ring tools, I first started to use those in back in 1994, 96. And it was great to actually see a simple way of doing it rather than using hand tools that were difficult and clunky. And so the beauty of using that particular tool uh, makes your netting so much faster. And I think many of you are using those and we, we, um, we use those on our training here. Another product we incorporated, this is a photo from many years ago, but the Ramset guns, I saw that my colleagues in the termite fraternity were using the Ramset. We started then, you know, 20 years ago, started incorporating that into using it in bird control. And so a great way to use the same fitting in just about anywhere. 
you know, in your RSJs, you can use a ramset gun into be between six to 32 mil of steel and still get it to hold. And in that same fitting, you can tech screw into your, your C channels. Unfortunately, the cable mast is not real great on the C channels and masonry, particularly on masonry, it'll blow and damage the, the, the masonry, but that incorporated with all your just typical um, drilling equipment and so on makes for a, a simple solution. All right, so to our favorite area of bird management is training our colleagues, training you know, members of your team. Um, this is the area that we love to get involved in. You know, I love you know, working at certain heights. Uh, I don't, I'm not so great. 20 meters and above, you know, these don't get too old for that. Um, but the idea is it's great to actually show you uh, the, the, the process of training, talk about safety, talk about site, uh, the site issues, laying out the job, um, planning it in advance and getting there and getting the project completed. It's one thing to have suppliers that just are technical, it's others to have, uh, you know, true relationships where you're uh, sharing ideas and hopefully that's what we're doing today. Uh, but the training that we do is also obviously like today up on YouTube, group training, but on-site training is where we find as, as our area of success. So on training, we love getting up at heights, showing you how to lay out your job, learning how the processes uh, that are going to be successful, speed and efficiency, and all of those things that go to completing a large project. So all of a sudden, we're just at the finish, and I'd just like to say what products to use that wear. And so we've talked about a whole variety of different products, but what I would say is it's important to go over what the session that I started with. Um, firstly, uh, understand your bird species, understand the bird pressure and what stage of development or bird behavior that those birds are in. Get the history from your client, gain assistance from your suppliers and colleagues, jump onto the Facebook forums. Uh, Australian Pest Managers Network is a great way to just share ideas. Um, determine the impact of the birds that are having on the facility and then establish a financial burden. If you can establish that financial burden and get your client to come along on the journey to help understand why it is that you're putting in, you know, the, the value of the goods that you are and help them understand the safe, uh, not the safety element, but also the savings of the financial burden on their building will be really critical to having a successful process. Then you look at your um, cost of your project or you're creating a project strategy and a proposal and installation plan. And I love helping our clients in that area. And then just look at how you can make that into a relationship. Not that's not just a once off project, but it, where you'd look at ongoing monitoring using maybe uh, sensors or just once a year inspections and creating a report. So it's a development of a relationship that happens over time rather than just a once off process. It, it tends to lead to more work, but it leads to much better satisfaction and a result from your client. So that's about all I had to say. Um, 